The title of this uh, reflects, I think, the fact that everywhere now we're talking about digital humanities. It's astonishing, and I think it is surprising. Uh, and I'm going to put on my historian's hat for a minute and just talk a little bit about why that is so surprising, but also understandable. And, and I think come to grips with that slightly as a way to think about what's next. And I think we have a world of work to do together. Uh, and I think I want to situate that a bit in terms of how we might take those, those next steps. Being here at the University of Alberta is just so wonderful, partly because you were so early into this. I see Sean here, and yesterday we were talking a lot about the Humanities Computing Initiative and so on. So the University of Alberta was on this dossier, it was, in, it was involved in all this very, very early, and it's great to see it's continuing. Uh, my colleague, uh, uh, Peter Baskerville, that uh, had the pleasure of working with in various guises for all the years, and we continue every time we see each other, we have more great conversations. I want to give a shout out to him to, uh, for, for uh, helping invite me as well. And I think it's great to see, I think, some of the work here that really builds on that, that great tradition. I also noticed last year, uh, in terms of looking at uh, kind of questions that are increasingly coming on the radar, but not ones necessarily that we looked at in the 1990s. And again, I think Alberta has been a leader in that, and it's one of the reasons I'm, I'm really uh, pleased to be here. At the same time, though, I do want to highlight a bit is that in terms of the ascendance, in terms of digital humanities now, I think playing such an important part of conversations across campuses and, and larger society, I think the stakes have also gone up a bit. So in other words, I think any institution these days who thinks they can rest on their laurels, can take for granted and so on, I'm sure many of you notice, for example, the $7 million gift uh, at the University of Pennsylvania for Digital Humanities just a, a, a little while ago. So uh, I think my sense at least is that this is one of those fields that uh, is changing very, very rapidly, uh, expanding, and it's taking s uh, significant institutional support and initiative, and that's why I think it's great to see the Dean, the kind of leadership uh, that you have here, because it really does come, uh, it, it, it takes, a, it really does take uh, an entire university to move this forward. As my point of departure, I want to focus just for a minute on a book that appeared last September from the field of history, and it made three arguments in a pretty aggressive way. One argument was that historians really needed to contribute more in terms of the town square, the public square, debate about the big issues of today. And it was a kind of a call to action, a call to arms, as they called it, for historians to get much more involved in trying to help make a better future based on understandings of the past. But the way they did that was twofold. And, and the argument was there were kind of two reasons, uh, two ways in which that could get done. One way was a much greater focus on what they called kind of big questions, looking at big questions over long time periods and, and really try to think through some of the really transformative aspects of historical change as a way to, as a way to move forward. The second one, which relates directly to our topic today, was they emphasized a view that I share, and that is what they call big data is really offering historians an unprecedented opportunity to do so. Now, I like the word evidence, and I don't think there's any historian who's ever going to say, wow, we have enough evidence, we don't need any more. <laughs> so so the, 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 the kind of, uh, reaction, I would think, it, it's not a hard argument to make that, wow, here we are in a time when at our desktops and, and or the mobile devices, we can look at unprecedented amounts of evidence about the past. Well, hey, here we go. Uh, but it turned out that it was interesting, and I'll just focus a, a bit on, on their book has had some interesting times. The other thing I do want to argue, though, and it's kind of interesting, is that they linked it to this notion of the humanities in crisis. And they saw it as a way out of this, a kind of solution, a response to the perceived humanities crisis. They linked that to this question of, of the short term, what they call sometimes short termism. We'll come back to that because I'm not sure that's a, a necessary piece of this argument. The other thing that was really interesting though, and I don't know if you noticed this in terms of they embrace the scholarly world of communication, the new world, and release this book 
in a printed copy, online, open access, as well as uh, in both HTML, PDF, but also they really, from the get-go, tried to engage. And social media became a huge aspect of this, and they really went at it hoping that their book would stimulate uh, international uh, debate, and in fact, uh, campus and communities, the larger public, about the extent to which to move forward, we really need to and must depend on understandings of historical change and, and the past. And I think that was really interesting. At the same time, in just about the same moment, you may have noticed the New York Times and featured Bill Gates and his, you know, he's on his, evidently on his exercise bicycle one morning and, and picks up David Christian's, you know, YouTube video on terms of his sense of big history, a course that he'd been teaching for a number of years, looking at basically from the big bang on and attempting to rethink what we mean by history in terms of really big history. And Gates, as you know, has invested hugely in this. So the, Armitage, the Golian Armitage book comes out arguing that historians need to really play a larger role, look at really big questions, take advantage of big data and so on. And that kind of interestingly connects with a debate about, wow, we need to uh, think bigger in terms of, of, of the big changes. And obviously in here as well, and, and with Golden Armitage as well, the connecting to issues around uh, the relationship between humans and the natural environment and so on. So an interesting moment. The reaction that went on over the winter, uh, I think there are well over 10,000 contributions to this by, by last count. Uh, and, but it's culminated in a recent publication in the AHR that is, in my mind, not particularly helpful. And it's by Deborah Cohen and Peter Mandler, who make a critique about the book, not about the kind of prescriptive side of things much, but around the extent to which their perception of what's happening now is justified with the evidence. And it's really interesting how they do that. They argue and they attack them on the, their own ability to look at the evidence. So these two critics go after Goldie and Armitage in terms of their use of evidence, looking at, for example, one of the things that Goldie and Armitage did was try to look at the time periods covered by dissertations over the 20th century. To what extent are they uh, big and small and, and, and so on, or getting smaller, and, and they go at this. And then they descend to some speculation about why, uh, according to them, Goldie and Armitage had some methodological issues and that's because they didn't try very hard to get it right. What I found depressing about that was that they never really engaged the issues. That is to say, is there an opportunity these days for historians to play a much bigger role uh, beyond the campus? Is there an opportunity now for historians to speak to big questions that are the focus of, of attention on campus and beyond? And are we in a time when big data offers unprecedented opportunities to do so? That, that gets sidestepped in that. So I want to go back to, to that a little bit. At the same time, and this is interesting, another little theme I want to introduce here is there was another article you may have noticed in the New York Times, which was written by evolutionary biologists arguing that if his humanities scholars did not get with the program, that in fact what was seen to be their world was going to get taken over by others, including folks like evolutionary biologists who were saying that look, you know, unprecedented uh, evidence, data, uh, if you're not going to get in, we're coming in in spades. And in fact, one of the really interesting aspects of digital humanities, and I'm currently attempting to get some, uh, to compute this to some extent, is how many leaders in the field of digital humanities actually come out of other fields, and, and including those on the other side of campus. So that's a really interesting dynamic, and this is a very aggressive uh, it was a, you know, very pointed uh, provocation to say, look, uh, this is going to happen, uh, be part of the solution or not. The One Republic of Learning is a bit in terms of La Mantendu saying, you know, we can do this all together. You know, we can, all of us together, come with us and so on. The implication a little bit is use our science methods, learn that stuff. Uh, but still, the, uh, their One Republic of Learning uh, emphasis is, is there. 
Well, there's no doubt everywhere you hear the date of tsunami, and it is interesting that the metaphors for this, the deluge, the tsunami, and on and on, they're always kind of like bad. These all came out probably around 10 or 15 years ago in a, in a big way. The metaphor is changing. It's still uh, often kind of negative and oh my goodness, but Armitage and, uh, Gulli and Armitage do a good job of trying to make it positive. And, and I think we got to think about that way, the unprecedented opportunity uh, that that's offered. Now, the role of historians, as we all know, when anyone gets up and says something's new, you know, all the, everyone's look, got their head down today, they're looking at those mobile devices. You know, our mission in life is always to get up and say, oh, we've seen this before. Wait a minute, you know, wait a minute. We, we always try to take uh, metaphors and so on, try to domesticate things. So, hey, no, no, don't panic. This is not, not uh, really new. My sense, though, is that, and, and here's a, one more quick example, you know, that illustrates this a bit. Marshall McLuhan, as you know, gets going in a big way at U of T uh, in the earlier 60s, especially in the Globe and Mail. This is from 1964, and, and my friend uh, Jeff Rockwell, who unfortunately is in Europe at the moment, he, he uh, turned me on to this very cool article from the Globe and Mail that talks about this research project with awesome implications, and I'll just read a bit. It says, a group of scientists at the University of Toronto is undertaking a research project with awesome implications for society. It's, it's interesting that the adjective awesome was then. I didn't know that. <laughs> if successful, they said, it could produce a foolproof system for analyzing humans. That sounds pretty good. <laughs> this one's not so good. And manipulating their behavior. I guess we say nudge now. Uh, or it could give mankind a surefire method of planning the future and making the world free from large-scale social mistakes. Hello. It goes down a little further, though, which I think is really interesting. We'll come back to that. Dr. McLuhan has been joined by nine scientists in the fields of medicine, architecture, engineering, political science, psychiatry, museology, the maintenance of museums. They don't quite say, where's Chuck? They don't quite say kind of good archival librarian science. But anyway, uh, anthropology and English, 1964. Good revolutionary fervor, uh, uh, a little more complicated. But there's no doubt, there's no doubt, maybe their timing of all that and the way they thought how, that, how smoothly that was gonna go, on, uh, go forward. But the notion of data now has become part of the conversation across society. Mainstream, there's no one who hasn't heard a, a focus in terms of, of big data. It's interesting, this is from uh, Brazil, uh, it, it's across cultures. Uh, it's really, really interesting. One example I think is good. The OECD did a report uh, in 2013 that just tried to list the different kinds of data now available at various levels. Uh, and it's a really good, I think, a good report that, that, that emphasizes the fact that, wow, if you want to understand human thought and behavior, we now have unprecedented uh, uh, amounts of evidence to do that. And I think this is a point worth stressing because people forget about that. And I'm gonna, you know, again, I haven't had time, been kind of busy doing other things the last eight years. I haven't had time to, to but I'm pretty convinced, and I think I'm gonna try to demonstrate this, is that if you look at the amount of evidence that researchers in our field were examining in order to better understand human thought and behavior across any of, any of our fields, up to, say, the 1960s. Minuscule, minuscule, unbelievably minuscule. You know, even in, in the Canadian case, great historians, Harold Innes, Creighton, and so on, the amount of evidence they looked at was really, really modest by any, by any standards uh, over time. So that's, so that's really, really interesting. Now, sometimes this is talked about, this is Dominic Lamb, many of you know, from IBM, who's, who's on this a bit, he now has left IBM, and he emphasizes this whole notion of data now, uh, big data, as the vast new natural resource. And he's trying to, it's kind of a rhetorical strategy, and we're supposed to think about this in terms of a, a, a new natural resource. And now the good aspect of that argument is that it, it leads to a kind of data-centric model, which is really good. So when you think about the digital age, let's face it, for much of the 70s, 80s, 90s, a lot of it was focused on the technologies. It was, a, and we still hear that, a technologically driven. 
And it was a lot on the processing power. It was a lot on the hardware side of things and so on. And certainly for a company like IBM, their change from really moving out of that business into focusing on data is a huge paradigm shift. And if you think about the digital age, data is really the defining characteristic. And I would also argue that in terms of thinking about this, I would argue that technology, whether it's the pipes, the processing power, and so on, are so far out in front now in terms of our, our ability to take advantage of this time, and it's data is really, so, the, so that's a good aspect of it. The bad aspect of it is thinking about data as sort of in the world of colliding particles or, or, or things underground and so on. And I think what historians and scholars across the social science humanities all feels, I think, our, what we've been bringing to the table is this notion that there is nothing, there's no such thing as raw data. In, in fact, and I think a good way to think about this is that we have to think about this in terms of a cultural production. We have to think about it in terms of, uh, and thereby the need to think about the protection, the preservation of it in, the terms, in, in terms of interpretation and so on. So I think now what we're able to bring to the, this discussion is a much deeper and more robust understanding of, again, what I would call evidence. Data is evidence at some level about, in our case, human thought and behavior. And I should mention earlier, here's another claim, that we would not be talking about big data. The economist uh, would not be in, in common circulation, any of that, if the data were not about people. That is to say, if it were just great data about more colliding particles or, or whatever, that would not be capturing the public conscious, uh, consciousness and it would not be everywhere the way it is now. What's really interesting about our age is about evidence, data on human thought and behavior, and that's really, really interesting. So this loops back to the kind of history part. My point of entry on this was really in the 1970s when, and again, I want to stress this, that it wasn't because we thought, oh, wow, now we have computers, I wonder what we can do. It's, it was based on a different understanding and new understanding of historical change. So what, what happens, I think, during the 1950s, 60s, and 70s is a, a, a rethinking of how change occurs over time and a move from the idea that to understand that change, we can focus on a few key individuals, the leaders of society and so on, to instead an understanding of change in terms of the entire population. And so what we see is a move toward saying, okay, what is the evidence about not just the history of the famous, but the history of the anonymous? And it's that new way of thinking that says, wait a minute, there's some new technologies that can help us here. And so I think that the different kind of sense of how change occurs leads to an interest in saying, wow, how can we look at this evidence in ways that, that make sense uh, across, across time? And so again, there's some of the volumes that, that come out of this era are, are really, really important. And, they, and what they show is that understandings of major transformative phenomena, in fact, need to be rethought based on evidence from a much larger segment of the population, not just the advantage and disadvantage and across ethnocultural groups, on and on, men and women, on and on. And there are a number of really important books that, that kind of change all those understandings. And I think that's a really, really important part in terms of what I believe is a shifted paradigm now. How does change occur in our fields anyway, words like deep complexity are really resonating with us now. Uh, and the extent to which, if we look at just certain types of evidence, we're just not gonna understand that deep complexity. That's the kind of theme that's continued in Peter Baskerville's recent, recent work, where he, again, looks at evidence and shows a revolution uh, that in fact uh, doesn't get picked up in, in, in terms of a lot of the other kinds of sources we, we might look at. And I think that's a really interesting, and you can think about this across fields now, which is, which is the part. The critique, which I think is interesting at this time in the 1970s, and 
to some extent endures, has a, has a few different parts to it. But one is definitely this notion that uh, of, the, of the great divide in grade seven. People who like words and people who like numbers. And somehow it was, if you, if you are willing to count, uh, that somehow this meant uh, either uh, for, for some small group, sometimes, that this was the way to nirvana, and for other groups, that this was the edge of the earth, that this was giving over to the dark side, uh, and, it, was, and, and it, it, it led to uh, a lot of, I think, pretty useless uh, debate, and I think it, uh, in a sense of context, sense of evidentiary meaning, and so on, and that, and that fuels and leads into the linguistic turn really comes important in the 1980s into the 1990s. And so the history side of this that had been a, among the leaders in, in the 1960s, 70s, and a bit into the 80s really starts to take a, 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 a step to the side. And it seems to quiet down at some level and, and, and become somewhat marginalized. There's also an, also an attack that you saw earlier, you know, who would really care what happened in Hamilton, Ontario, or Peel County, or like, you know, you're studying places that don't matter very much. Uh, and, and I think there, there's the, uh, that kind of critique uh, as well. And you pick that up in the Gildy and Armitage book uh, a, a little bit as well. What's also interesting though at this time, and, and under the radar, and even for, for folks like my, myself, in the 1960s and 70s, I was not aware that slowly but surely there was another group coming together on, on, the, on the literature side, on the text side. And humanities and computing starts to emerge slowly but surely. A lot of it initially is linked to sort of better, faster ways to do what we're always doing in terms of editorial work and, 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 and that kind of managing, managing text and so on. But there is some innovative work. This is from 1977, the University of Waterloo hosted the, the third international conference on computing in the humanities. And what was interesting at this time is these are people beginning to look at, at, at words and, and, and study in many cases, masses of, of text uh, in a way that's kind of divorced from uh, that other group that's looking at evidence of human thought and behavior. And it's kind of interesting. Uh, uh, this group is much smaller, uh, pretty, pretty marginal uh, in, in many ways. Over time though, and particularly during, I would say the last 15 years for sure, and that's why we get the expression digital humanities, Humanities have really come to own digital in, in, in lots of interesting ways. Uh, you don't get the digital humanities and social sciences. Uh, you, you don't get that integration, and we'll get to talk more about that. And it's the attempt to look at systematically analyze words often that leads to what becomes to be uh, talked at as the computational turn, rarely the word quantitative, which had been a word used earlier, Computational, which seems to be uh, a, a more popular word. Everybody now started doing engrams. Uh, I mean, who hasn't seen their students messing around in the back during a lecture, popping in all sorts of, all sorts of words and, and so on? This one, looking at uh, searching for Canada, I always get a little spooked by that, that decline at the end there, but I assume that that's just because the sources are not as great. But anyway, I also want to, though, I want to, I want to share with you a slide that Peter Baskerville gave at, at an event a, a while ago, where he really emphasized the kind of visceral reaction to this notion that you could learn about the past in terms of counting. It, it, heated would be a good way to uh, think about that. And the whole notion, again, and this quote's interesting because it juxtaposes this notion of quantification being different from interpretation. And again, these aren't, you know, Grafton, certainly not a insignificant person in, in terms of scholarship. My sense is that uh, we're in an era when we're trying to get over and move beyond. Uh, and, I, and again, I just, this was, we were at an event uh, at McMaster, big history, big data, kind of so what, that was held just a few days ago. And one of the arguments uh, uh, that was being presented there uh, was, gee whiz, wow, and this is like, this person tweeted, that, that's pretty mean. Like, now you tell me that, uh, 
uh, that what I thought was a good strategy isn't going to work. What, what's this mean? Well, I think our mission is to really accept that the humanities in terms of their historic uh, kind of uh, tendency, gravitation toward the individual, and the social sciences with a gravitation toward collectivities, that in fact it's an and world. And you may have noticed when I was at the Social Science Humanities Research Council, I never ever said social sciences without humanities or humanities without social sciences. I believe deeply that it has hurt us enormously not to understand that we're all trying to do better in terms of understanding human thought and behavior. And to separate that does not work well for us. I don't think it works well for anybody else. This is not to say, by the way, that I think it's time to change the expression digital humanities. I'm willing to go with, go with the notion that, hey, that's caught fire for a variety of reasons and let's run with that. But I think we have to embrace the notion that at the end of the day, what we're trying to come to grips with is the deep complexity of individual specificity uniqueness, but the reality of that contextualization in, 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 in multiple level collectivities. Similarly, I think it's crazy to make a false distinction between what sometimes is thought about is discovering, revealing data patterns and interpreting data patterns. And again, I think these are false distinctions that aren't helpful. And I think that we need to see their oneness, their wholeness in, with, a, with a new vocabulary. Similarly, I think it's not a debate between statistical significance, which I, I think is, is really, really helpful. And this notion of what we're really about is trying to come to grips with meaning, with personal social significance. And, and again, these are not competing. This is not a versus world. This is not an either or world. This is a, this is a both and world. And similarly, with this cross-sectional data, longitudinal data, I was happy to hear that Peter and colleagues have a version, a volume coming out soon on the ways in which we can use big data to follow people through time and so on. And I think that's terrific. So we need to get over a lot of those false dichotomies. Again, when I was at Shirk, I never ever used the word qualitative or quantitative. For various reasons, those words do not work well anymore. They set up a false dichotomy. Everything is quantitative, everything is qualitative, and I think it's been, not been helpful. It's a, it's a 19th and 20th century, I think, legacy uh, dichotomy that does not work well for us. One recent example gives me, uh, uh, I think, is worth focusing on. I don't know if you saw that in Lancashire, one of the leaders on that computing and, hum uh, and humanities side at University of Toronto teamed up with a computer scientist, Graham Hurst, and they attacked what had been an ongoing issue, and that was when did Agatha Christie start to suffer from Alzheimer's? And they said, hey, this is a question that we can answer. And they loaded up all her novels, or at least 13 of the key ones over a, a period, and they analyzed them in terms of vocabulary, sentence structure, word structure, and so on. And they were able to specify and able to see that. And it's, it's really interesting. It's also led now to some diagnostic therapeutic uh, strategies, which is which is really fun. And they end up winning the New York Times ninth annual year in ideas award in December 20, uh, 2011. The other thing that's interesting, I just want to emphasize, you often hear about big data, uh, to remember that in fact the evidence now in our fields is significant. Uh, this, this, this talks a little bit about and makes a comparison. The string of letters in this corpus of five million books is a thousand times longer than the human genome. It, it's some interesting aspects of that. You know, we think in our field now, when we say big data in terms of human beings, in many cases, it transcends, goes beyond big data for particles and molecules and so on. Uh, it, really interesting, and especially when you throw in video, uh, as you know, and there's been some really interesting new, new strategies there. This is from 2012, it recently got updated and there's some new ones in there and it's an international phenomena, as I suggested earlier. Uh, and, and so Alberta, that was early on and one of the only ones uh, joined by Mac and then a few others, basically now it's a, it's a much more complicated field. The other thing I think is, is this notion of how it's gotten attention even in you know, um, publications like Science, Nature and so on that generally don't pay much attention at, at all to the humanities or any aspect of studying studying human beings and, and it's gotten their attention uh, in, in interesting ways. All of this was at the heart of our effort uh, over the last decade to say, well, okay, 
Suppose we embrace a notion that things are not qualitative or quantitative. It's not an either or world. How about we embrace the notion that in fact it's a both and world. Can we build a research infrastructure that really brings together all oh, those traditions? that brings together the traditions of text, analysts, uh, a t a text analysis, that brings together the traditions of the kind of census work, that brings together all these traditions in interesting ways, and shows at the end of the day that they have this common denominator. They're all evidence of human thought and behavior. And can we do that in a way that allows us to, to study uh, change over time? And that was really the notion of the, the Canadian Century Research Infrastructure Project, in, 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 uh, uh, that you know well here. And my sense is that that kind of epistemological uh, kind of approach reflected that new kind of me metaphysics of how you think about and how you conceptualize change. And I think it's, it's really, really interesting. We took seriously the notion of trying to get behind what, we, what ended up getting written on documents in terms of how questions were framed, the responses, uh, all aspects of that we looked at the whole process of how these documents were created, the whole of provenance aspects and so on. We took advantage of uh, uh, spatial analysis in terms of trying to locate not only in time, but also in space. And I think what, what we found at least is that uh, in, in our sense, and it links back to Goli and Armitage's point, is the importance for us of really uh, helping people develop the kind of competencies and skills necessary to come to grips with data in all kinds of, of different ways, the, the deep complexity of it. And I know this was just, you know, kind of the, 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 the technical side of this a bit. To do this sort of thing draws on an enormous array of skills, uh, an enormous array of, of competencies. And I think clearly when you think about how our universities are organized right now, you think about how our curriculum are organized and so on, we have to wonder, are they really preparing people to, to, uh, to, to really embrace the, the new potential? More and more now you see taken together text and data mining. I don't like, I mean, because obviously it's kind of drawing the distinction between data and text. It's kind of rehearsing that. But clearly they're trying to, in a variety of ways, get, you know, see more frequently and in there and, and trying to connect those traditions. The digging into data challenge that I know a number of you competed in that, that uh, was launched by uh, uh, a number of different uh, research agencies in, in various uh, countries, I think was really, really interesting because it, it put the, its finger on the importance of developing new epistemologies, saying we're just not prepared, we're not equipped, how do we do this? And what are some experimental approaches? What are some new ways? What's some innovation here that we can, that we can rely on? I also want to emphasize uh, the extent to which this has caught the public imagination. I, think, I don't think we can underestimate that. And I think we should try to understand it. I think we can try to appreciate it. Why is it, you know, we often say, in our fields, oh, people don't appreciate us, they just don't know all the wonderful things we're doing, you know, we don't feel the love. So why in this case do we feel the love? Uh, and I would argue it's because there are now uh, a thirst for uh, enhanced understandings of human thought and behavior in the past and present as a way to move forward. And I would say, I think we're slowly coming to grips with one example that I like to use Think about our school systems. We spent 200 years building school systems that we now know are designed in ways that don't foster learning. We know, you sitting and listening to me, it's about 18 minutes before you start thinking about dinner. Your ability in terms of that old school transmission of model, my ability to broadcast, we are reaching the end of this, or maybe we've already reached the end of this right now and today. My sense is that and now we're taking that seriously. We're getting some new models. We're experimenting. We don't have a lot of answers yet, but we're starting to think it through. We're experimenting. The word engagement, we know now this active learning is not a special thing and so on. This has deep implications for how we structure schools and so on. But this is true as well across businesses, the public sector, on and on, how we form communities and so on. Again, back to my earlier point, how little evidence was brought to bear behind those policies, practices, all those decisions made that got us this far in terms of human behavior, minuscule. I think we're now we're taking it seriously and, and I think that the 21st century has the potential 
to be the century during which we took seriously the challenge of understanding human beings, human thought and behavior, and as a result of that, we didn't make a better society. Uh, and I think it's kind of historically the first time that we, I think, are starting to realize that, it's, that the solutions are not going to be a better widget. The solutions are not going to be technological fixes. The solutions are going to have to do with our ability to build societies that seem to relate to who we are as people. We have a lot of work to do, uh, and I, I refer earlier to that conference that you, you got going, because this could go a lot of different ways. My sense, the 21st century could go in really bad ways, and I think that's why it's, it's incumbent upon us to get, to get involved in this. It seems to me it's, it's instructive that, you know, the educated non-specialist is, is getting focused on this. We need to teach our students algorithmic thinking. What does that mean? What's behind it? How can they unpack when they do these Googles? What they, a world of skills that they have to develop, I think, that are going to be necessary. And there are all kinds of ways in which I think we can contribute to this in terms of much more sophisticated understandings of the relationship of individuals to collectivities and the, and the interaction of human beings with the larger environment and, and so on. There's also studies now talking about uh, neuroplasticity, the extent to which there's aspects of the digital age which in fact are having some uh, really, uh, potentially some really unfortunate consequences. And, and these are again fields that we can contribute to. All those questions about who pays, who owns, who controls, digital divides, uh, preservation, curation access. One of my heroes, as you may know, is Chuck Humphrey, who for years now has been um, a voice, uh, a persistent, unrelenting voice in terms of emphasizing to people that look, if we don't build the, the preservation infrastructure, if we don't build the data management plans, if we don't really do a lot of work, uh, this could really go sideways in a hurry. And there's lots of examples. You can think about that. I always use th this image to remind us all that the 1961 census was the first census that was done in a completely computer-based way. We can't read it anymore. And there are lots of these examples. How many of you have floppy disks or all sorts of things that you can't read uh, and, and that are useless? My, another point, and, and, I'm, and I'm closing here, is just to say there was a really interesting article by one of the pioneers in terms of, of digital history who has posed the question a bit differently in terms of what's at stake. And his point is that he, he's concerned that what's happening is digital is now being domesticated in terms of a 19th and 20th century model. That we're taking it and, and making it fit. So rather than have it truly innovative, rather than seeing it as unprecedented opportunities and so on, we're disciplining it and making it fit old school. This was some of the, the first MOOCs, not the later MOOCs, but some of the first MOOCs took old school broadcast lecturing and said, oh, this is Nirvana and uh, we're gonna save a whack of money and we'll have students all over the world and so on. Now that debate has gotten more sophisticated and I know what Sean and others are doing here is, is really you know, moving things forward, but still the reflex that somehow digital is gonna be a cheaper, faster way for us to do what we've always been doing uh, is out there and, and I would encourage you to read this if you haven't. This brings me to what I think is really a key point. We have to get over this notion that the different ways of knowing on campus can justifiably be thought about as solitudes. It seems to me that we have to horizontally connect. I like the, I like the metaphor of T-shaped. We have to horizontally connect the different ways of knowing. We have to get rid of the hierarchy of, of ways of knowing. We have to embrace a much more robust epistemology. And one, I think, that is able, will be able to help us, at least, take advantage of the unprecedented opportunities. Our students are changing. This is one of my favorite graphs. This is, this is from 2006, and it'd be worse now, I think, uh, more pronounced now. Students were asked, undergraduate students were asked, where would your favorite place to work be? Google and Apple come out top. What's most interesting is students in our fields, in the social science humanities, are more interested in working at Apple and Google than others. Really interesting. We have to work on our curriculum. Some great initiatives. The Mellon Foundation's given a lot of money to an effort to do that. I think all of you, I'm involved at the University of Ottawa in a program renewal exercise. We have a lot of work to do. 
my sense right now, and last night at dinner we were talking about this, Mo and Heather, that the, the, the extent to which digital literacies, are we really embracing the importance of this? Are we, are we really thinking about our curriculum in terms of enabling graduates to thrive in the digital age? We have work to do there. It's also happening at the graduate level. Heather and I were talking about a conference that's coming up in May that's the result of a long period of consultation. Uh, we have some work to do on this scale. I don't think there are any easy answers, no obvious next steps, but uh, I think we can, do, we can do much better. My other favorite slide from my years at Shirk, we asked people, how do you define yourself? And again, this is a very robust survey. Many of you probably answered. We, uh, uh, 22,000, we have a lot of emails at Shirk. Well over 6,000 of you answered. Thank you very much. And the, and the results knock, knocked us out absolutely knocked us out. It has now become, and this is anonymous, it has now become not cool to describe yourself as exclusively disciplinary. And what's interesting about this is that it's across fields. Social sciences, humanities, always throw in history. It's really, really interesting. And the extent to which they, again, in a confidential survey, nothing at stake, describing their own work as quite interdisciplinary or extremely interdisciplinary. I think our students are changing, I think we're changing, but when I look at our curriculum, I look at a lot of the policies, practices, on and on, we have work to do. What's also interesting is that the pressure and the interest is coming from other fields. One of the oldest uh, uh, is the medical humanities, one of the longest standing, but it's coming from all over the place now, which is really interesting. Here was a, a conference in the US, National Institutes of Health funded, Data, Biomedicine, and the Digital Humanities. And again, it's looking at the epistemological challenge of, of dealing with uh, complex data and turning to humanist for engagement on those issues. Fascinating, fascinating. The upcoming Congress in, in uh, this spring at the University of Ottawa, I hope you're all coming, working hard on that. Interdisciplinarity, big focus. Similarly, at the, at the joint now, the Canadian group as well as the American group is gonna be in Montreal as well. It's a great program. If you're there, I encourage you to come along as well. So I think you know, what we're trying to come to grips with now is studying a social world, open, historical, complex, dynamic, nonlinear, and tending towards states far from equilibrium and they move through time and space. And we're trying to think about all this in, in, in lots, of, lots of interesting new ways. I do think that we are at a, a time of really unprecedented. I think the, the opportunities before us are are really uh, extraordinary. I agree with my colleague Pierre Levy, but I do think we have a lot of work to do. And to return to where I started with the Golden Armitage book, I think this whole notion of trying to understand individuals in terms of collectivities, at the end of the day, it means that as individuals, I think we can make a difference. It seems to me an ability to choose uh, to create the future we want I think we can, my sense is together, my hope is that together I think we will. I think when our descendants look back on us, I think we want to be able to say that we did in fact uh, seize this opportunity. Thank you all very much. Wow, that's a great comment, and you, and you raised a whole bunch of different things. One is, uh, I'll, I'll quickly talk about the notion between big data and the dignity of the individual. 
or the, the, the place of the individual. And it, it was really interesting. Uh, Charles Bouchard from Quebec, who, who uh, as you may know, is a historical demographer, a historical sociologist, did a lot of work on fertility trends and so on, but ended up writing a really interesting piece showing how big data at the end of the day is the way in which we understand the individual. And I, I thought about this a little bit in terms of what's happening now. Why companies, for example, are all about big data? Is it because they want to uh, uh, figure out, as they did not that long ago in the Mad Men era, some big demographic groups and so on? No, they want you. And so for them, big data is a way to, and similarly in, in education, right? Personalized learning. Where big data is going is to the individual. Medicine, personalized medicine, personalized health. So I think this is... Oh, the values. Okay, so you, the second point you made was the question of values, right? What's driving this in terms of values? And I think that's my point is, I think this could go a bunch of different ways. Surveillance society, on and on. I think uh, there's no doubt about it, knowledge is power. And I think having the data, controlling the data and so on, is, is this thing can go uh, for exactly the reasons you're implying. But that doesn't mean that we give it up. And that doesn't mean that we're still willing to send our students out there into the world, not really understanding what they're doing. Uh, you know, I think it's incumbent upon us, and that's why I close with that slide saying, we can make a difference. It, it, you know, so, so I think we got a, a lot of work to do, because I think you're absolutely right. Surveillance society, whether it's, you know, there are all kinds of different aspects of that. But the winners at the moment, I'm not sure it's, it, it's not the ones that we're real scared about. And I've had people say to me, Chad, you know this thing, unprecedented opportunity, blah, 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 listen, this train has left the station. You know, a lot of these big companies, uh, you know, they're, they're getting a stranglehold on this. Uh, and by the time the rest of us wake up and actually the we'll, undoing this will take years. Could be, could be. Back to your comment about how do we come to focus on the whole. Absolutely, it was in the context of everything from the women's movement through uh, the race riots in the US through on and on. But within that um, was I think uh, a new appreciation of how change occurs. And so, the, you know, certainly, uh, you know, and there, and there are lots of examples of this where political leaders, and, you know, you got to feel, somebody like Obama feels this, he gets into power, oh, you know, I'm president of the United States. And he's like, are you kidding me? You know, I'm officially the most powerful man on earth. Really? So my sense is that, um, and, and again, Scholars are part of the larger society. One of the bad dichotomies was somehow that we were going to be able to stand back from society and look out. Are you kidding me? So I think now we have the whole sociology of knowledge field and shown has taught us six ways from Sunday that, hey, we are part of society. It'd be foolish for us to think that somehow we're removed from all that. And no, we have to instead come to grips with it in much more sophisticated ways, getting the question of values out front. Getting the, the, getting the questions of, of power out front, on and on. Absolutely. Uh, we, there, there was an event here last week looking at the future of the PhD in the arts, and uh, the closing keynote was by Anne Crook. Uh, and during that keynote, she said, we can't imagine our lives as scholars without the digital humanities, implying that we must all be digital humanists, or we are all in some way. I was kind of like to it. Curious about your thoughts. I think there's a world of misunderstanding about that. And certainly I know now in my task force uh, that I'm co-chairing with Adele Reinhardt at the University of Ottawa, back to the ascendance part, now it's like, oh, oh yes, uh, I, I, uh, I know how to use Blackboard. I'm a digital humanist. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah, I, I would say I define, and actually I'm, I'm going to go to talk of the Congress that tries to beat this over the head. I think it has not served us well to avoid defining the digital humanities. So here's my crack at this, and I'd be interested in, in, in reaction. Digital humanities definitely is a prerequisite. People that are employing digital tools to advance knowledge and understanding, whether it's among their students and, and so on, absolutely. But the second one is active engagement and a, an attempt to contribute to 
how that is all done. So I think if you're a, a user, I don't think you get to call yourself a digital humanist. I think if you are attempting to help us, and we need it, on the epistemological side, on the pedagogical side, in terms of advancing this, then, okay, you're in the club with me and, and we can have conversations and the strengths and weaknesses of various approaches, what do you find, and so on, absolutely. So I, I think that they're, I don't know if it's a bandwagon yet, but definitely it has become, and, and I'd like to do the survey on this, will anyone admit to being, uh, and, and my sense is that we've gone from active resistance vocally where not many people now are willing to say, hey, you know what? I think digital humanities is a fad. This is going to be over soon, and we're going to go back to the way it was in 19 whatever. I just read books. I just read books, right? I, I don't think people are willing to, they might think it, but, but I don't think they're willing to say it much anymore. I could be wrong. I agree uh, with a lot of what you said. I think the train has left the station in this regard, but just for the sake of being a uh, devil's advocate, I want to ask you about people creating the sources for digital humanities and the danger that we're creating a bit of an illusion here in the sense that most of the undergraduate students we're training now, they're not using archives, they're not going to libraries, they're using digital sources, right? And it's leading them to you to draw broad conclusions. For instance, uh, most of the students doing papers using newspapers, using the Globe and Mail and the Toronto Star, not because they're the best sources, because those are digitized. And we have seen a trend too now, for example, Library and Archives Canada, a lot of local archives are trying to digitize their sources too. But this is an impossible project. You're never going to digitize everything in the archives. You simply don't have the resources for it. And it got me thinking about this idea of who's actually creating those digital sources and what happened with the undergrad students might be actually happening to us as researchers too. For instance, I'm on a major project now where we're digitizing public accounts and government documents to identify all community grants from governments to advocacy groups across Canada for 50 years. But who's choosing those sources? Who's deciding what gets digitized? It's only those of us who've got these huge grants that are able to do it. The vast majority of scholars are never actually going to have a voice in determining what gets digitized. So, it, it concerns me that it's creating an elite of people to decide what actually gets digitized, and that's filtering down to the rest of us because we're using these sources, but we actually didn't decide what gets digitized. And so I want to hear your response to, is there any danger of either creating an elite who decide what gets digitized and the illusion that we're actually drawing on a broad base of sources, but really, it's because kind of, like you said, like you've shown in your graphs, there's only certain types of sources that are conducive to being digitized, are there not? So isn't there a bit of a limit to uh, the boundaries we should recognize in the digital humanities? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's the word illusion is, is the one that's the danger. From my point of view, it has, it, thus it has always been, right? I mean, uh, the amount of evidence that anyone got to look at, the difference was, you know, back in the day, was that the evidence that got looked at was by the prof who got the grant to go to the archive and whatever. So. So I would say on balance, it's still, as you suggest, the tip of the iceberg, but let's face it, there's a world more evidence available now than earlier. Is it still biased in all kinds of interesting ways? Is it still a reflection of the personal choices and, and on and on and on? Absolutely. And we would never, ever want to, to imply that that was not the case, right? The, and there's no, it, you know, I'll give you a good example because I think you're putting your finger on a real danger. There was a president of a major university, you know, a few years ago now, who, who said to me, you know what, uh, like before uh, convocation, just for fun, I asked my uni university librarian to get uh, together with our IT head and tell me who was going to get a diploma and had never taken something out of the library. <laughs> it was about half. So in their years as an undergrad, had never taken something out of the library, like so that it triggered uh, the transaction. So your point is that you know these days, without a web presence, uh, you know it's just in the, in particularly in a world in which getting grants to go to archives and on and on is is it can, can be although it's probably always challenging, but but certainly we're aware of it. But that's all the more reason to address these issues with our students, to get them such that they understand the algorithms that lead them to those sources and not other sources, that get them to understand the corpus 
of documents saved from the past. And I would argue, you know, back to a, a collaboration that Peter and I did uh, a while ago in terms of we were saying, okay, how about we try to um, describe in a kind of archival sense the holdings of local repositories on Vancouver Island with a view toward historical research. And one of the things, unintended consequences of that that we started said, this is gonna be really interesting. By just doing that, their chances of survival are gonna go up. Nobody knows about them. So, so there are all kinds of issues that we need to embrace with our students. Our curriculum is just not there now. We are not having adult conversations about this. I don't think, I don't see it when I look at many curricula, uh, particularly at the undergrad level. Yeah. I guess in a way what I'm going to do now is just bundle a bunch of anxieties and present them to you for comment. <laughs> <laughs> Which, and they have to do with the programming. I'm not so concerned, and, and it's the questions that I have are around disciplinarity, interdisciplinarity, and collaboration, each of which can be put together in different ways. I'm not very concerned about changes in the next two, three, five years, because those are going to be incremental. And subject, they're, they're going to be consequence of a number of compromises and nudging people on, et cetera. But when you show that slide from 1964, the Globe Mail article from 1964, I have to say, my, I, I, it gave me heavy because change is so slow. So the question is, what should graduate training look like over the 25 to 50 year horizon? And will disciplinarity, should disciplinarity survive? Okay, so, I absolutely love your question, and I want to emphasize that I've, I've been having these conversations a lot uh, with, um, I know you're incoming, but with your counterparts across the country and internationally. You are the first person who has put their finger on, I'm going to rephrase it slightly, that we are in, I think, a deep paradigm shifting era that is, is by the nature of the beast, I think, uh, a complex, slow process that's going to take, as you're implying, decades to work through. I think that's actually okay at some level because we are in experimental era. You know, I think we need a lot of experiments. I mean, some things we know. Chuck Humphrey, I totally agree. We need data management plans. We need preservation infrastructure. Like there's certain things, you know, we need to understand provenance. We need, you know, there's just certain things that I think, right, we need to get there. We need to address values. There's certain things we can say, but I think there's also a world of, on, on the how and the what. How do we get there? What do we do? What are the, you know, what does it look like? I think we need a lot of experimentation. It's gonna take some, some time. But I think your point is, and, and, and the metaphor that I like a lot, is to think about it, and I love the way you phrase that. Think about it as a journey, and, and then the question becomes, in the next three, four, five years, what steps do we want to take? Keeping in mind the where and the why, you know, keeping in mind, which necessarily is going to be 30,000 foot at some level, but just say, what are some steps we can take right now that, that would help? Uh, us advance. But again, I think in, in initially in May, when you, when, you, when you come to that conference at McGill, it's going to try to bring this together. A lot of the focus, from my point of view, sadly, has not been where you want it to go. And I know, hey, listen, you know, I, I know what, you know, wake up in the morning and you read that flood of emails and you're like, whoa, you know, daily life can, you know, but are we going to step back? and say, this is not about, you know, and I, and I say all the time, don't think about this in terms of technological change. Don't think about this in terms of budget cuts. Put them to the side. Let's pretend if we had no new technology and we had all the money in the world, wouldn't we still want to make some dramatic changes? And I say yes. But it takes some thinking, uh, and, I, and, and I, I do. I think we need, on the one hand, to think about out there in terms of what was it 21st century going to look like? What are some of the things that we might want to really strive for? And then what are some steps we can take? Merci. Essential competencies 
I didn't see any of the big universities uh, listing the big data as one of the uh, major elements. Uh, is, there, is there a problem there, or is there an explanation to that? That's it. It's a great question, and I think we need to think more about it. A couple of thoughts that jump to mind. One, I do not think we have compellingly articulated the value proposition. Uh, I think uh, that the engagement, particularly in the public square, and that's where Gildy and, and, and Armitage are encouraging us, because I think there's a thirst. I mean, it's who would have thought, let's say in the 1950s, who would have thought that the humanities would be approached by uh, biomedicine. Humanities would be approached by um, uh, the private sector. I think we're still reeling from that a bit. Like, you know, I still, I mean, I remember when I started at Shirk, someone, a nice person, friend, came up to me and said, okay, Chad, how are you gonna deal with the R word? And I said, the who word? the relevant word. So I said, okay. So I remember the first meeting uh, I went to, I got invited by the Federation, I went and I said, okay. I hear somebody said to me, you know, relevance. We, how, how are you gonna position with this? And I said, it's really easy. Please raise your hand if you've devoted your work, life to work that's irrelevant. <laughs> that ended that debate. <laughs> and I didn't hear any more about that anymore. But I think, I think, frankly, it's also slightly scary. Uh, you know, I think it is. Uh, you know, like, wow, humanities. Now people are saying to us, like, uh, we can really enhance uh, recovery from traumatic incidents by appropriate um, identification of key poems. I mean, it's fascinating. Uh, in, in the performing arts, there's a tremendous study out of Norway, or maybe it's Sweden, I can't remember now. So the story is of, and again, just using an example, story is of people uh, waking up in the re recovery room after serious operations, quadruple bypass, and so on, right? And one of the huge issues for these people is infection. And, and so those, and they know that those first, that period can be really, so what they, you know, lots of antibiotics and so on. So what they figured out in a, in a study I, I, I found was really interesting, is that if you take a patient and so they're still, they're still asleep, they haven't woken up yet, and you surround them with artwork, and I'll talk about the artwork, what it has to be in a moment. So when they wake up, rather than seeing the inside of the recovery room with all kinds of things happening and so on, they see this artwork. Infection rates go down, stays in the hospital, I think you're cut in half subsequently and so on. Uh, blood pressure, and I mean, no matter how you cut it, improved health outcomes, right? And so then there's a lot of work on, uh, well, what kind of images, right? And it turns out that across cultures, it's kind of interesting so far, is that there's two. One is, and this kind of resonates with me, I kind of feel this, pastoral <clears throat> scenes. Countryside, quiet, pastoral scenes. The other one is interesting is children playing. Again, you gotta get them outside, you, you know, you gotta take out cultural kind of things and so on, but just kids. So if you wake up and those are the first images you see, unbelievably good health outcomes, right? So what does this say? It says, I mean, these are examples and there, there are many, many others. So I think in humanities, our focus has been, and, and I don't say, you know, I think it's, I, I think our, our, the ways we can contribute, I think have gone from here to like here. And it's coming to us from so many different areas. And I think we're working to try to get our balance, try to get our, position ourselves in that. And what does that mean? How do we, how do, we do all that? I can remember um, in Ottawa, we pushed hard saying, look, Canadian society and economy, we've got to really embrace the digital age. We've got to get away from a reliance on natural resources and all. we've got to get value up in terms of, of, of economy and so on. We push all this. And so at one point, uh, we said, hey, why don't we let us bring in 
four or five, six researchers from digital humanities just to talk about this. So we contacted some of the leading figures in, in text, uh, Ray Siemens and, and I think Jeff, a few of the others. And we said, you know, come to Ottawa and talk about your work and so on. They were like, whoa, like, that we're going to talk to who? Like, what? And, <laughs> and, and it led to amazing conversations. And they, to a person, came away from that and said, who knew? Who knew? Uh, and in fact, in the, in the federal government, now, in the new strategy, the, the, there's a lot on big data, actually. It went from, when I started, it was science and technology strategy. And it moved to science and technology innovation, and in all that, there's a fair amount on digital and big data, and the example they use is from our fields. I think it's a journey, deep paradigm shift. I think there's a long way to go. Uh, how I think we need experimentation and so on, but um, I think it's urgent not to try to figure it all out, but to start taking steps and to engage. You touched on curriculum and digital literacy. Right. And I'm curious to know, within the like, um, public education, where you see digital literacy? Because I've heard or read that sometimes digital li literacy is marginalized when they have back to basics kind of movements. Absolutely. And again, I think a lot of the dichotomies, a lot of the vocabularies uh, have really hurt us uh, on that score, right? I am on the side of, listen, I think our students uh, need to learn a lot of different languages. And one of them is coding. It's a language. You know, and in fact, I like to tell the story, Jerry Sinclair, who was a prof of Renaissance drama at the, and she tells this story, I'm not speaking out of school, was a prof of Renaissance drama at Simon Fraser University. She takes a, a, a mat leave in the 1980s, and so she's spending a few years at home with her kids. And at that time, Commodore 64 comes out, and they're playing on, she describes it like on the floor, they're messing around with this. And she starts to, and, this, and it's governed by BASIC, and so she's starting to look at this and look at something, and she says, you know what? Heck, coding, it's kind of like a sonnet. It kind of repeats back, and there's a cadence to it, and the punctuation and stuff. Anyway, to make a long story short, she goes on to become the president of Microsoft Canada, prof in Renaissance drama, making a connection that I think is, you know, a connection that we have to have conversations about and not dichotomies about. So I think we have a lot of work to do uh, along that score. Uh, I think learning algorithmic thinking, you know, we used to call it, you know, philosophy 101 was logic hugely valuable and in fact a lot of the people that went on in big data I don't know and, and you know are from philosophy right IBM was hiring a lot of philosophers along with the mathematicians and a lot of those conversations were quite happily going back and forth right we right it's uh, so those false dichotomies haven't worked well at all I work on, on narratives of memory right so would you say as a historian that big data can be partially or maybe totally one of the answers to the tension between memory and history? Really interesting question. So I'll run with that a bit. So you're, you're juxtaposing a lot of the data now that shows in terms of historical consciousness, particularly young people, but all of us, uh, are learning or, or, or developing narratives about the past outside of any formal school system and so on, outside of our disciplines of history with a capital H, um, and that big data might provide a way in which to re-enjoin, re-engage this conversation. That's a, again, boy, you always, I love doing these things. You always learn stuff, right? Heather's comment, that's just such an interesting point. Fuel for your fire. I would say the extent to which now and we were talking about this this morning with uh, Ancestry.com. So now you've got a billion dollar industry in which people are able to confront uh, received notions of the past and so on, and actually look at historical evidence and develop, yeah, well, it's, what a great thought. I, I'll have to think more about that, but it's a really interesting link. I see. Will shift the way that the projects are actually assessed because in some areas. 
Great question, and and you know certainly, um, again, I would go back to the a huge change. I think during my eight years, we took some steps forward. We went from 36 programs to uh, you know seven. We tried to do this uh, in terms of what we called creative open spaces, trying to get open it out and so on. But I'll give you one little piece of data that knocked me out and still knocks me out. I showed you the data where people, you know, how do you, how do you, how do you think about your research? And they say uh, interdisciplinary, blah, 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 rather than exclusively, right? Now applicants, and we thought applicants, give them choice. What would be, do you think, applicant, an appropriate way to have your proposal adjudicated? Do you know what people said? Disciplinary. They want people think, and again, I think this is fascinating, we need some work on this. People think that the best, the most favorable application, uh, sorry, the most favorable appropriate evaluation that I'm gonna get for my proposal is someone just like me, someone just like me. And there's just not a lot of evidence of that. If the someone is just like you, they're gonna get to the butt in a hurry. And so it's an interesting phenomenon. And I know sometimes people are surprised. I mean, everyone who applies, in my, in my sense, says, oh, they've got an innovative proposal. Uh, you know, it's really going to be great, all these new things and so on. But the prospect, when you talk to them, about it being evaluated by someone who actually might think that, rather than someone who says, no, wait a minute. You're missing the tried and true here. You think you're advancing. I'm generalizing horribly. But it, it was interesting for us that we set it up so you could go multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary, disciplinary. Like we were given the gambit of options. Uh, and I personally was, you know, surprised and frankly disappointed that when you looked at applications and you said, wow, great reviewers for this would be from that field, that field, even, and even within the social science humanities, let alone anybody else. Uh, that there was well, I do. I, I think that, um, and I don't totally understand it, but I think that in terms of we function with a little bit of the notion that, um, that comes out of the 19th and 20th century, that I'm really writing for six other people. You know, I'm really, what counts for me is those six other people. And I think, you know, there's a great book, if you haven't read it, uh, Michelle Lamont, uh, how Professors Think. So she's a Canadian at Harvard, published just a couple of years ago, How Professors Think. And it's a, it's a chapter by chapter kind of analysis of our tribal cultures. Mm -hmm. And she's looking at it in terms of evaluation and so on. I think we have a lot of work to do on that. Yeah, because I mean, obviously how we think according to your graph was we think interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary. So I just, you know, it just seems like kind of And, but, it, but it's in people's minds. How do they reconcile that? If they see their work as quite interdisciplinary, now there's some, you know, and you would think, well, okay, it's because they've learned. My proposal got turned down because that committee was fill, you know, full of people from the other side of campus uh, or, you know, someone not like me, and they, they, didn't, they didn't understand me. They didn't get my work. And what I noticed, and how many people have had this experience? that you're in a selection committee uh, uh, and somebody in that committee knows a world about that proposal. There's something that just says to these other colleagues, I'm gonna demonstrate that. And that, uh, I mean, again, I'm generalizing horribly, but that can lead to getting to the butt in a hurry. We think even, and again, even, you know, when I write book reviews in my culture, if I say, well, you know, suppose I read a book and, and this is the best book I've read on this topic and I write a review that says, wow, this is the best book I've read on this topic, they'll think, you know, Chad's really gone flabby. He's just not really, you know. Um, and, and, that, and that differs across, across, and that's what Michelle Lamont describes, from economics to philosophy to different fields and so on. There's a lot of very variety there. I, I think we need a lot more attention. We need some adult conversations about that. Um, I don't think we understand those dynamics very well. I know at Shirk we focused on them a lot. We had you know, observers and they were reports and we tried to structure it and so on. 
Um, but it's obviously a, a, a huge, you know, something that transcends a research council. Um, I, I run the program that supports the whole time. Okay. Having been on the community myself at some various points, having had shirts. So I, I can understand that talk about the trajectory in the history of shirts and education. I really like what you're saying about being more interested. And I'm going to have the opportunity to have a conversation with Hewitt in a month. Um, and one of the things I would like to talk about is how do we structure the uh, I'm speaking the language I can use. Yeah, it's the argument I can use. I would like to set up opportunities for people who are currently applying to answer and people who are currently applying to sure to be able to get together. Yeah. To yeah. be able to apply jointly yeah. for very cool projects on ethnographies and nanotechnology yeah. or you know, looking at how can we work with poetry and science and medical outcomes. Yeah. You know, and we don't have that structure. Well, we, but we have a great precedent, and that's digging into data. That was the first time that NSERC ever partnered with SHRC with a common adjudication and funding, uh, right? I think the digging into data model is a great model that basically is an application from whoever, whatever collection of people is appropriate, that then is adjudicated appropriately by whatever the agencies are involved. And then they all live by, it's a single adjudication, because the old way is the parallel is horrible. A single adjudication, and then everyone pays their own. So they contribute appropriately, right? I think that's a great model. I think digging into data was, was pioneering in that way. I think certainly that's the way to go. My sense is, again, back to the metaphors, I like T-shaped. I think that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to take the advantages. I mean, I think vertical structures are good. I, I like the expression discipline-based interdisciplinarity. I think we all got to come from somewhere. So I like, I like that vertical structure as that, but then it's got to be horizontally connected. And I would say that in terms of our curriculum, I would say it in terms of all so many things, right? We have to do that horizontal connecting piece. I, I like vertical structures. I mean, interdisciplinary, and, and, and Sean, maybe, you know, in terms of interdisciplinary means we got everybody in there, we're all gonna smush it together. Quickly, that can start to become a vertical structure. We've seen this in, in many fields, the studies fields and so on, right? That can, all of a sudden, how do we build T-shaped mentalities? How do we build T-shaped policies, practices? I think that's a real challenge for the 21st century. Is there a goodwill action? <coughs> Well, the last eight years demonstrated that. You know, the new president, as you know, worked with me, and we'll see, but I have every confidence. And the team is, I think, committed to it. So I, I would say, hey, steps forward. Thank you so much for coming. I really appreciate it. Yeah.